Good morning, how is everyone? My name is Brent Stackhouse. I run the Venture Fund at Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. I'm uh, incredibly excited uh, to be here today with our esteemed panel of uh, venture capitalists. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, but uh, you know, in the last couple of years, I've had a chance to uh, present at these uh, uh, redefining early stage investment conferences around the country, uh, in Chicago, in New York, in Boston, and in San Francisco last year as well. And uh, it's always a fantastic opportunity to bring together entrepreneurs and investors and try to share some sort of inside knowledge around some of the experiences that we've had on the strategic investor side uh, and to provide an opportunity for uh, folks around the country to have a chance to ask directly from us really what are some of the ins and outs that make the uh, process of trying to raise money from strategic investors a little bit easier. Uh, incredibly grateful to our hosts at uh, the Re Redefining Early Stage Investment Life Science Nation Conference System as well as uh, the uh, Marie Memorial Hall for uh, having us here today. Uh, Mount Sinai is an $8 billion health system. We have, uh, in terms of revenue, <laughs> we have uh, eight hospitals uh, in the general metropolitan New York area. It's about 3,500 doctors, about 42,000 employees. Uh, the Venture Fund's been around since 2008. Uh, we have about 20 investments, um, and uh, we've actually had a pretty good return over the years. Our average investment size is about half a million dollars. Uh, we look at everything from care delivery, uh, surgery centers, urgent care, it's about half the portfolio, uh, to uh, digital health, uh, service companies, uh, medical uh, devices. I don't do anything in terms of therapeutics, uh, pills, pose, potions, and lotions uh, we don't touch. And I'm only investing in outside intellectual property. This is not in some sort of accelerator fund. I'm not funding Mount Sinai Innovation. There's a different team that does that and does an exceptional job at it. Um, Anita to my left from UNC. I'd like to uh, give folks some background on, on you and your program. Sure. Anita Blackfence, Rex Health Ventures. We're the venture arm for UNC Healthcare. So, like Brent from the East Coast. Um, UNC Healthcare is a 13 hospital system located completely in North Carolina. Um, we started the fund in 2012. We look for companies that have a strategic fit with the healthcare system. Um, we do invest occasionally in therapeutics, as you can imagine, being in the Raleigh Durham area. Um, there's a lot of companies in that space. So when we do invest in that space, it tends to only be local. Um, but we haven't invested outside of, of the area. But we primarily look for companies that have a strong strategic fit with the healthcare system. So that could be devices, it could be diagnostics, it could be digital health. Um, we've invested in companies that are really focused on back office operations. We can talk about some of um, the portfolio companies. We have 12 portfolio companies to date. We typically invest anywhere from 500,000 to a million initially. Um, we go up to about two, a little over two million uh, in follow-on investments. Look forward to the discussion. Perfect. Well, Shri Paul from uh, Cleveland Clinic Ventures. Uh, we are a relatively new team that was established under our uh, $8.5 billion endowment fund at Cleveland Clinic. Um, I am a partner there for medical devices. Um, our, our portfolio is roughly 40 companies. 60% uh, of that is in medical devices. Uh, uh, historically, all of those have originated at the clinic. Um, uh, Cleveland Clinic itself is a 26 hospital system um, across Northeast Ohio, Florida, Abu Dhabi, and now also constructing a facility in London. Um, uh, our investments have typically focused across uh, medical devices, healthcare IT, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Um, as I mentioned, uh, historically we've mainly focused on internal investments, um, uh, intellectual property originating at the clinic, but we are in the process of expanding that and, and working with a few venture funds in, and co-investing alongside that. Uh, I'm Lauren Bruggen, and I work at the Heritage Group. Uh, we private equity fund. Um, our investors are strategics. So we have about nine hospital systems. We have Tenant Health, Memorial Hermann, Sutter Health. We have eight Blues plans and some other healthcare strategics like Cerner, uh, Metasys, and, and Cardinal. Um, so our model is really to um, have a couple of people who travel around the country, meet with these strategics, meet with people in all different groups across the, the LP organizations to really understand what their strategic imperatives are which then informs our investment decisions. Um, and then importantly, post-investment, we like to bring those portfolio companies into our investor base as customers. So we've had about 60 customer contracts signed between our portfolio companies and our LP organizations. Um, we're typically investing 
anywhere from 10 to 20 million into our portfolio companies. And we focus on healthcare IT and healthcare services. So we don't do med device, drug development. So Lauren, uh, just to interrupt real quick before I pass on to Garrett here, uh, you say you invest 10 to 20 million. What is your initial investment size? Our initial investment size has gone down, you know, as low as about five million. Uh, but from a portfolio construction standpoint, where we are today, our minimum investment initially is going to be around 10 million. Yeah. Garrett. Hi everyone, I'm Eric Bigantis, OSF Healthcare Ventures. Uh, our mandate is much similar to Anita's and Shreepal's combined. Um, we are a $75 million fund one, uh, internally funded venture capital group. Um, we fund internal and external innovation. Um, we will invest in companies that have a strategic fit with what we're looking for in terms of the provider patient ecosystem at OSF certainly are uh, fans of syndicating our deals with other healthcare systems, uh, as well as financial investors. Uh, we have about 13 companies in our portfolio right now, uh, span the mix of uh, everything outside of therapeutics, uh, that we have made therapeutics investments, and uh, we'll continue to explore that area. We also have invested in other venture capital funds uh, that have uh, uh, skill sets earlier than us, so seed funds and contestants. Um, and then one larger exception uh, fund. So, um, uh, 13 uh, portfolio companies right now, our initial investment size uh, about 2 million, and we'll support that uh, with multiple uh, times that amount over the life of the company. So, Gary, tell us a little about OSF. Sure, OSF is a 14 hospital healthcare system based in Illinois and uh, at the outposts in Michigan as well. I joined about a year and a half ago to uh, strengthen our West Coast presence. I'm based out here, so it cuts down on travel time for my two other partners that are in uh, Illinois. Um, and we, again, closely interact with all of the business units within our health system and often require their buy-in before we make an investment in a company. So it's it's pretty much a guarantee for investing in you. We're certainly going to be partnering with you on uh, uh, deploying and working or developing technology within our health system. Terrific, thank you. So uh, just to, to the audience here, uh, first of all, can the folks in the back of the room hear all the panelists, or do we need to do a little better job of microphones? Everyone's good? Okay. Uh, I'm curious, who here is an entrepreneur looking to raise money, or has a startup company, or, or is, is running a company? Okay, about a third of the audience. And who here is an investor? Okay. Wrongly. Interesting. As those are different numbers than we expected. I'm going to change all of our questions. Um, and who's a consultant or someone wants to sell us something? None of you. Come on. There's somebody in this audience wants to sell us something. Um, so one of the things I think is really exciting about uh, the panel is that you sort of have a breadth. You have sort of the continuum of strategic investor types. Uh, Anita and I are in making investments off our balance sheet. Um, even sometimes Mount Sinai writes a check or two, it's crazy. Uh, Anita is far more sophisticated and her shop does an amazing job managing their fund. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, historically in the intellectual property you know, acceleration space, now starting to launch a fund. Uh, and then you have Garrett, who actually has a dedicated amount of money that he can sit there and commit. And then Lauren, who's sitting there with a portfolio of limited partners, who's uh, an institutional investor, but has this really special angle on the strategic interests. And I think um, that's sort of a nice uh, uh, opportunity for the audience to be able to get a sense of you know, where we see strategic investment. It, it is not, um, uh, you, you meet one, you understand what they all do. We are all very different. And when you're thinking about trying to partner, since a lot of the folks in the uh, audience here are investors, recognizing that we are unique in our, uh, uh, in our angle and how we invest and what is it we're looking for. So I want to sort of unpack that a little bit with the panel uh, and then open the, the questions up for, for Q&A. So in terms of investment types, who on the panel here is making seed or pre-seed investments? And just a level set, when I use the word pre-seed, I'm talking about pre-revenue. This is often a product uh, idea. Product isn't necessarily viable yet. Um, it's sometimes you know two people and a dog with a really great idea that's looking for money. You and I, just the two of us. All right. And then in terms of seed, Series A, these are companies who have some revenue or at least have a viable product. Well, I, I would question that definition again. Yeah, yeah absolutely. On, on the device side, yeah. yeah. I think Series are no longer relevant to the true stage of the company. Unpack that for us. Well, I think one we're looking at right now, they're raising a Series B3 
Um, they're a very mature company, so I mean, a typical Series B would, which, um, they wouldn't have the amount of revenue they have. So I, I just think the Series definitions um, now no, no longer really define what stage the company is. Um, but to, I think we can all talk about sort of what we're, we're looking for and the maturity of the company. Um, we've invested, um, we have invested seed, but those tend to be spin outs from the university system. We already know the team, we know the technology, and they're fairly mature. Um, and they had need, needed to outside funding um, until we've invested. But typically, we're investing um, a little later. So, with the definition you just described of uh, looking for a company that they have a product, they have a team, they have some revenue, they may have a, a handful of customers. Um, so they're going to be a little further along. And the reason we're looking for that stage is we want a company that's ready to come in and really benefit from a strategic partnership. If they're too early, we can advise them and help with, with um, some product development. We may be able to help them build a team. Um, but we really want the, the to be able to utilize the full access of expertise within the UNC healthcare system, whether that's on the physician or clinical side or on the operations side. We want them to be ready to leverage that. So that's a key factor. Lauren, would you say that's similar? Yeah, I was actually going to say our, our stage of investment is relatively similar. So you know we're looking at healthcare IT, healthcare services. Um, we'll traditionally look at anything that has at least a million dollars of revenue. Um, I will say that we've skewed a little bit later stage where we really look at our for companies that have you know, five, ten million plus of revenue. And for you know reasons pretty similar. You know, they need to have that team that's built out so that when we bring them into our LP organizations, the hospital systems and the payers, they're really ready to, you know, commercialize. Um, so they're not, you know, small teams that, that aren't ready to interact with a large hospital system. They're not trying to get their first, you know, pilot or two, you know, within a hospital system, but they've already kind of been there, done that, proven it out, and are ready to implement across our LP base. So, yeah, so there's a couple of different things at the, at the clinic that are probably relevant. Um, so just in terms of check sizes for uh, pre-seed and seed, um, we, we typically will invest about 350000 in pre-seed companies and up to a million dollars in seed stage companies. Um, as I said before, historically they've been focused on in, uh, intellectual property that's been generated out the clinic. But to the audience here, what I would welcome is for entrepreneurs to, who are actually seeking ideas to come and work with us and figure out that there's any intellectual property that we can uh, uh, build a company around. Uh, so we welcome that opportunity to work with, with the audience here on that. Do they have to come to Cleveland? No, they don't. Yeah, they don't. They don't have to be included. In fact, uh, beautiful Cleveland. Beautiful Cleveland. Yeah. Um, many of our companies are are spread across. Uh, some in Bay Area, some in Minneapolis. Uh, they don't have to be based in Cleveland. The other aspect I'd like to highlight is that Cleveland Clinic has a different group, a different team that focuses on advising um, uh, younger startups with regard to clinical validation, uh, with regard to you know running uh, uh, and preclinical studies at the clinic identifying appropriate KL uh, physicians at the clinic who they should partner with. Um, that group is called Business Engineering, um, and that's that's a service that is offered uh, to entrepreneurs or, or, and companies who want to use it. Um, you can, you know, we, can, we can talk more about that offline if, if that's of interest. Mr. Sure, let's stay on the theme of entrepreneurs just for a second here, and then yeah. I want to go back to the investment work that uh, Lauren was describing. Garrett, is there something at OSF that's similar? If, if you are uh, an entrepreneur trying to seek a partnership, looking to pilot, develop something. Well, what is the uh, point of entry at OSF? There are actually a few points of entry. You know, clearly having a clinical champion already is, is a great starting point and that probably is the the one that uh, is, is the quickest to build momentum on, but the other two are the venture group and the uh, innovation partnership. So <coughs> what's the difference between those two? So the innovation partnership uh, group actually uh, works with a wider range of companies then the venture group will invest in. So there are early stage, much larger companies. It's more about solving business issues and clinical issues within the uh, healthcare system. And that's their mandate. Our mandate is to work, you know, support certain ones of those and other ones with financial investment. And they will all end up you know, funneling together and addressing the issues of the, of the health system. But um, I would say the partnership um, portfolio is much larger than ours. Yeah, so UNC has very similar setups. So we have the UNC Innovation Center and certainly, you know, 
having a clinical champion get you in the door very quickly. But they will partner with early stage companies, not seeking investment, but seeking that partnership. Um, and they also have partnerships with very large companies as well, you know, the IBMs and SASs in the world. But they, they do look for those partnerships. But then, again, it's separate from the venture fund. Occasionally, companies will come to us via the Innovation Center. But we're def we have different mandates and have different responsibilities. No, well, your Innovation Centers take equity in exchange for that partnership? Ours has. Um, not very often, but they have done that in the past. It's not a requirement, but on our end, um, I know it is with some health systems. Not a, not necessarily with ours. It depends on how much work we're going to be doing. So if, if our analytics team is going to be building code, yes. If uh, if if they're just going to be you know giving feedback, then. Uh, yeah, no, so similarly at Mount Sinai, uh, the innovation partners team uh, mainly focused on developing intellectual property of, uh, at Mount Sinai. Uh, on occasion, outsiders have come in uh, that have done some partnership work, and uh, when intellectual property is being co-developed, uh, usually there's an equity stake required. Um, going back, uh, Garrett, when you were describing uh, how important it is to build a partner with a clinical champion, how does somebody go about finding that clinical champion at OSF? Do they call you? Uh, I'm not the clinical provider mostly in all these cases. Um, you're you're I'm not going to be the uh, patients, right? the Yenta, right? Of, uh, right. I'm not going to be using the device on patients, so or, or technology within the uh, you know, the, the confines of the firewall. So it's not going to be me. Oftentimes, you know, the the company will already have some you know other value proposition that the clinical champion has attached on to. How do they find them? It's the same way that every you know, device company accesses KOLs and um, tries to get a you know, momentum going in terms of adoption. Um, you know, it's a conferences, networking, the, the standard affair. So somebody approaches you, or I'll yeah. the question, Anita. Somebody, it sounds like you're doing a lot of head nodding, similar model. If somebody approaches you today, Anita, and says, oh, I'm really looking for a cardiologist at UNC who can help with my new doohickey, can you make that introduction? If it's cardiology, probably, because we have... Um, Do you want to make that introduction? It's, um, we have our, our physician in chief for cardiology sits on our investment committee, and he um, he really enjoys you know looking, seeing what's out there. Um, but mostly, um, it would go through the UNC Innovation Center, and they'd figure out, um, because they are so much more clinically engaged than we are, they're going to know whether there's a clinical champion that may have an interest. Um, but I agree with Garrett, the majority of it's networking. Um, the majority of it is, is folks figuring out who they want to work with and getting someone to make that introduction who's got that relationship. Yeah, the uh, the analogy I would make here is uh, um, when you're looking for these physician KOLs to work with you, are you looking for the supermodel or are you looking for the guy or girl next door, right? Um, you know, you uh, it is a natural reaction for most companies to aim straight for the luminaries in a, in a particular field. But you've got to remember that they may not have the bandwidth. Even if they have initial interest, they may not have the bandwidth to help support you the way you need to. Uh, what you need to do is identify physicians who are younger, hungrier, um, uh, who are able to provide you the direct kind of support that you may, may, uh, may need. Um, and um, uh, in, in, at the given clinic, in, in our case, you know, I can help support, uh, I can help provide you those uh, connections. Uh, and I work with uh, the team that I identified earlier as business engineering to help identify who those physicians could be. Now, I just want to add one thing to that. Um, from the Sinai perspective, um, the, uh, the challenge I've witnessed with entrepreneurs coming to the health system is finding an individual uh, uh, champion is that that individual champion's political capital changes over time. And sometimes the person who is going to be a, you know, a great partner for you could internally stop being uh, the right person to be championing your cause. And so I always advise that you try to diversify the number of uh, stakeholders that you have within an institution. People leave, people get busy, <clears throat> There's a Zika outbreak. Next thing you know, your project's on the sideline because it's no longer a priority for that you know, key opinion leader who's been championing your cause. Or, as sometimes happens in my highly politicized institution, somebody falls out of favor and you do not want to be associated with that individual. So it's really important that there is a team there uh, that's supporting your initiative. Now I'm curious, uh, at Heritage, since you have all these amazing uh, limited partners who are uh, 
uh, uh, hospitals and other strategics. If somebody were to approach you today wanting to get access to uh, use a tenant who was one of your investors, are you in a position to make those kinds of introductions? We, we don't. Um, we, we don't. Uh, most of the time. There, there are definitely caveats to that. Um, what I would say is, you know, as a, a financial investor, we're very much focused on, you know, the returns of our fund. And so, you know, we have these great relationships with our hospital systems. We want to make sure that we can reserve a lot of our introductions for our portfolio companies. And the caveat to that is in conversations with our LPs, there are areas that they highlight to us that they're very interested in. And when that happens, you know, we go out of our way to figure out who are the leaders in that space who can provide the you know, product or service that they're looking for and make introductions that way. Um, so we, we do it um, relatively often, but it's, it's not driven from an entrepreneur coming to us saying we would love to get an introduction to tenant. It comes from tenant saying, I am really focused on this area within revenue cycle management and I, I can't find the right solution. And we'll surface those to, to tenant. That's helpful, thank you. So I'm curious to the panel here, since we do sort of have this kind of breadth of experience and that there is a, sort of a variation kind of along the spectrum in terms of our investment strategies, why do you think an entrepreneur should work with your organization rather than somebody sitting next to you? Uh, start with Garrett at the end. <laughs> There's a, a statement, I think it's from the political side. Um, if it flies in Peoria, it'll fly you know, elsewhere. So that's a, that's a good uh, starting point. We're not a, we're, we're, we are affiliated with the University of Illinois um, uh, Academic Medical Center, but OSF itself is not an academic medical center. That said, we do have, we have uh, the Illinois Children's Hospital as part of our health system. So there are many different um, areas that we touch from a you know, holistic integrated delivery network uh, approach. No, you, you, yeah. you touched on something there I think is really important, specifically with the rest of the people sitting on this panel. Yeah. Why do you think it would be a benefit to not have an academic medical center as a strategic investor, <clears throat> since I work in one? Sure. Well, <laughs> there's often, if it, if it wasn't made here, it's not good enough mentality at the, uh, you know, the yeah. academic medical centers. Um, you know, I think, you know, that is, that has merits, but sometimes it has obstacles associated with it. With us, we're, we're looking to solve problems, we're looking to uh, move quick. We're only going to make problems. <laughs> we're, we're not necessarily looking to, you know, rule the world or, or win the game with our, our investments. We're looking to just humbly solve our problems and offer those solutions to the similar, uh, you know, health systems that we think we've got to provide. So, I'm going to give the, the follow-up response here yeah. to the clinic. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Thank God Mayo's not here. <laughs> That's um, yeah, I, I think that uh, cap, capital is only one part of the equation, right? Uh, you, you can probably get that capital from many other sources. Not, not saying that that's easy to do, but that's possible. Um, what you're really looking for in a health system partner, as you all, all well know, is, is the guidance to build your company out. Um, that guidance can come in the form of, of clinical guidance which of course physicians at the clinic can, can, can very well provide. Um, but there's also guidance that you can get in terms of what is going to make sense from an IRB perspective uh, for running clinical trials, designing protocols uh, for medicine and therapeutics particularly. What is going to make for sense from a supply chain perspective? Um, and there, are certain, uh, exist, there is certain existing infrastructure at the clinic that, that facil facilitates all of that. Uh, for a healthcare IT company, okay, what is the process that you would need to follow uh, to, to pilot something at the clinic, uh, integrate with its infrastructure. Um, it, and, and those are some of the things that you really want to look for uh, in, in a health system partner, whether it's a clinic or somebody else. So, not to tease you, because yes. this is definitely the pot calling the kettle black, that sounds awfully bureaucratic. It is, and my, I, would, I would definitely say that, that you, uh, if you're planning to engage with a particularly a large health system, you want to factor in a lot of time uh, for uh, going through the bureaucratic process. There is lots of things and checks and balances within the health system that unfortunately they need to worry about, right? They need to worry about, is it going to break down our infrastructure and workflow in other parts of the organization? Uh, they need to worry about conflicts of interest. Um, they need to worry about um, uh, running a business, of course, uh, and whether it's uh, you know, sustainable uh, uh, 
able to run a sustainable, whether it's a for-profit or a not-for-profit. Um, so there, there are lots of things that, that the health systems need to worry about. It's not easy running an eight and a half billion dollar health system. Um, so you know, it, you can pretty much figure out in, in the priority of, of things. Um, uh, while physicians, uh, while innovation isn't the culture of the clinic, it will fall within a certain priority of things uh, uh, for physicians and other stakeholders. Now, at UNC, would you define, I know you do have a medical center, but you're sitting at Rex Hospital, do you define yourself as an academic medical center, the best of both worlds? Yeah, but, that was the yeah. question. Yeah, I was about to say, I mean, we really are structured in a way to have the best of both worlds. So we, um, we were intentional about putting the fund at Rex, which is the largest community hospital within the UNC healthcare system. It's located in the capital. Um, when we thought about what it would look like to partner with companies, uh, similar to Garrett, mo the majority of care across the country is provided in settings like Rex. And when we're vetting companies with our internal experts, um, if it resonates at Rex, it's probably going to resonate across the country. If there's about 5,000 hospitals across the country that look like Rex, there's 50 some odd academic medical centers. Um, we've also made culture. I think Gary hit it on the head. I mean, the academic medical center tends to have a culture of, well, we could do that. Why do, why do we need a partner? I mean, that's we should just do that. And and we've actually turned down some promising investments because we've gotten that response. Um, and to date, we still haven't executed in that space. Um, so you know, hopefully, the the entire institution is really learning what it means to partner with startups through through what we're doing. But. We have access to the entire spectrum um, within the UNC healthcare system, but we really began our vetting at the community hospital level. level. Can I can I add one comment in favor of academic centers? Uh, right. So uh, they are academic centers for a reason, right? Uh, there is a lot of uh, academic and research value that uh, uh, early innovation can bring uh, to physicians, whether it is in terms of becoming an early adopter and an, and an early KOL in a particular technology or is it in, in terms of uh, uh, publishing and, and running clinical trials at the clinic. So all of those are, are big positives and us as a strategic health, uh, uh, as a strategic VC, those also factor into the whole uh, equation of whether we invest or not. So yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. I should have, I should have commented. Um, when, we in, when we invest, one of the, the factors that we're really considering is can we be a, a, a real strategic partner to this company? Um, we, of course, want the financial return, and that's a big part of our due diligence, but just as important as can we be a meaningful strategic partner. And one of the ways that we measure that is for our existing portfolio companies, our CEOs telling other new CEOs, you want to work with Rex. And we get a lot of our deal flow from our existing CEOs. They see the value. We are tapping into the academic expertise to publish either research papers or white papers um, with our portfolio companies. Anything that our portfolio companies need post-investment, whether it's market research, whether it's it's access to those clinical expertise, we're gonna deliver on that. We're gonna do whatever we can to ensure that the company can hit their, their growth goals. So I, I want to sort of conclude some comments around uh, the advice of product entrepreneurs and shift the conversation a little bit around uh, co-investments. I think so many people in the audience here are investors. Um, from my perspective, it cannot be said enough, uh, just reiterating what so much of the panel has already discussed, how important it is to choose an appropriate partner uh, for you to seek investment from. And uh, I've often advised startup companies to rather than go to even hospitals at all, to go to large multi-specialty provider groups. Uh, they're centrally managed, they're usually well capitalized, and uh, they're able to be incredibly uh, nimble. Uh, and they can sit there and adopt and spread a uh, solution very, very quickly in a way that takes us a very, very long time. And if you are an entrepreneur with you know, a, a burn rate, a limited amount of capital, you, you may not be able to survive one of our sales cycles. I, I, I've witnessed several companies not along the way. Um, and so I, I do have to reiterate how important it is that you are thoughtful, that there are more than just large academic medical centers out there, that there are nimbler versions, be it UNC and OSF and the way they model their work, uh, and that there are also not only community hospitals, um, which may be cash strapped, but large multi-specialty groups, or if you have a very specific thing, uh, I've often, there's a large urgent care chain in New York City that like 160 locations, I think they were valued at a billion dollars. They're a great partner if you have something that's you know, consumer focused, because it's an urgent care company. They are incredibly focused on the consumer, so anything that's uh, 
you know, touching a bill payment or communication uh, registration systems, I've often turned to them for their advice because I know they can model a lot more quickly than I can. Gary, so you want to chime in? No, okay. So, um, since so many of the folks in the audience are investors, I'm curious to hear from the panel, and I'm gonna start with you, Lauren. You know, what is it that you look for when it comes to co-investment? When you're uh, putting together, uh, are you putting together syndicates? Are you usually the lead? What is the responsibility you put, or heritage puts on itself when it comes to trying to capitalize one of their investments? Do you write your $2 million check, or $5 million check, and wish the entrepreneur best of luck, or are you shepherding them through some of that fundraising process? Yeah, so we um, are typically going to lead deals or co-lead deals. Um, we like to partner because there are a lot of investment opportunities that we see that require more capital than you know, the 10, 5, 10, you know, 20 million that we're going to put in. Um, so we do partner you know, quite a bit. Um, I would say what we look for in a partner is going to be someone who can add some value. You know, there are a lot of people who can write a check, so we're not looking just to fill out a syndicate. Um, we also tend to shy away from heavily syndicated deals. They tend to be... Why is that? Well, because then it becomes a little bit of um, a lot of investors investing just for the sake of you know, the financial side of it. They're not, you're not going to be able to have you know, eight investors at the table in a round and they're all going to be adding value. I would say one of the caveats for that are some of the rounds where there are a number of different hospital systems that are all investing because now you have access to, instead of just one hospital, by having you know, one of these folks feed the round, you know, everyone together, being able to pile their resources. So that's different. But what I was thinking of when I think of a syndicated round is a you know, six, seven, eight VCs you know, as a, a part of the round. Um, at Heritage, we're very active, so we take a board seat and we form really close partnerships with our management teams and really shepherd them through uh, each of our LP organizations. So you require a board seat? We, we do. I, I don't think we've made an investment yet where we don't have a board seat. Um, and so what we would be looking for in a partner is you know, it doesn't have to be the same value that, that we add, you know, with our strategic LP base, but, you know, tangible value. You know, maybe they have a lot of experience in a certain subsector within healthcare, uh, but there's going to be a, a reason that we want to partner with them outside of just being able to, to fill out a round and write a check. Uh, Garrett, you're running fairly large size checks. Yeah. Are you leading rounds? Uh, we've led about a third of okay. our rounds. Uh, we prefer not to lead, actually. We, uh, we will, if there's a very compelling reason to do so, typically a smaller round. Uh, we prefer to work with other uh, financial and strategic investors around a syndicate. Now on the due diligence side, are you following uh, an institutional investor working off their due diligence work? Are you, are you doing that yourself? As it relates to you know, spending money on intellectual property review, we'll typically leverage the leads uh, work there. Um, but in terms of aligning strategic initiatives within our organization, we, we go to our clinical champions and often, you know, would like to have a pilot in place and see results from a pilot before we invest. So there's there's uh, you know data to, to review, not just expectations. Um, I will say there's there's a tricky uh, spot that we often, as the venture team, get put into, and this kind of goes to just the healthcare system in general being slow to adopt, we'll often go to our, you know, clinician uh, groups for feedback and oftentimes, you know, they're thinking, no, this device you know, isn't gonna work the way it's supposed to be. So oftentimes the, the feedback is negative. And so we have to circumvent that and, and find more than one voice to get feedback from because I just feel that you know the, the do no harm or you know what we're, what what we have now works well enough is is the, the first reaction that we get despite the fact that you know, change is coming and there's a better way off to do things so it's just a, a mentality that we often have to navigate through um, so and that might be different academic at academic medical centers too yeah and so I think that will uh, definitely different at academic medical centers, but also you, you have to pay attention to the structure uh, with which uh, the co-investment uh, is set up. In the case of the clinic, um, you know, I think we, uh, because we're, uh, we're formed on the endowment fund, you know, our, our preference is to co-invest alongside the funds that we are in LPA. Um, and I know what that does is though, it, it presents a kind of a chicken and egg problem, is, you know, uh, should the company come through uh, that LP fund? Or should it be? Uh, the, should the should the clinic actually take a look at it, say something, and then 
send it uh, to, to, to the LP fund uh, for further evaluation. Um, and it is, it is, I guess, my job to kind of try and figure out if I can break that cycle, right? Um, the other thing I would say is that for, for us, again, diligence would be completely uh, largely independent uh, of, of, the, uh, uh, of the, the fund that we are investing alongside. Um, uh, and I think that the, the funds uh, appreciate that. Um, it's also, it's in, the, it's, in the, it's in the nature of the clinic. The clinic is, the physicians at the clinic are fiercely independent. Uh, they, they will, and this is a, it's probably a note of caution as well, you know, be careful about what you're signing up for. Um, because they, they will express their views. They brought down big, large blockbuster drugs in the past. Um, so, uh, so those are some of the dynamics that probably you need to, uh, you know, you would have to think through and I would have to as well. I want to give you the last word before we uh, open up to uh, questions from the audience. But uh, one, one thing that I think both uh, both Kripal and, and uh, Garrett uh, touched on that I think uh, cannot be said enough about Mount Sinai. If you are an investor and you're looking at Mount Sinai to be shining a light towards where great investments might be coming from, you need to realize that that academic medical center mentality of what we do here is better than what you do anywhere else can be somewhat problematic. And uh, this is something I fight every day within my institution where uh, I'll just use a, a medical adherence solution, uh, we'll get developed at Mount Sinai and we will assume that that is the best medical adherence solution on the market, not realizing there's like, what, 2,000 medical adherence solutions. And there is no one with the responsibility of doing that market surveillance and coming back and saying, this isn't best of breed, we shouldn't be putting our resources into it. And so my concern would be as an independent investor saying, well, you know, if Mount Sinai is investing, if Mount Sinai is using it, this must be great, and that you cannot operate under that assumption. So Anita, uh, thoughts on co-investment, what you're looking for from your partners, and whether or not you are moving forward with uh, putting syndicates together. So uh, we, we actually, um, with, with Brad and some others, we held, about a year ago in February, we held a summit really bringing two strategic investors together. Um, a lot of the hospital-based funds um, are fairly new. We're seven years old, but a lot of them are younger than us. Um, and our rationale was we're all figuring this out. We're all trying to figure out what best practices look like. We're all trying to help really change the culture within our organizations, and we can learn quite a bit from one another. So from that, um, we've developed what's called the Strategic Ventures Group. We meet monthly, um, we're meeting later today. Um, and we look at a lot of deals together. We all invested, well not all, eight of us invested in a company this spring. So we're gonna to continue to look at companies together. Was that, uh, that was Gauss Surgical? Yeah, yeah. So I think, mean, yeah. Was Gauss Surgical. Yeah, it's a think company based out here. Three of the five three of us, of us yeah. Yeah, are, are in that deal. Um, and I think there's a lot of logic for us, um, all of us, and in looking at companies where we're all bringing our due diligence because Eric's right. Sometimes the physicians will get very negative feedback, but it's based on their view of the world. You know, we may have physicians that get really excited about a particular company, um, and then we all bring together our financial expertise to ensure that, that um, we're all making stronger decisions together. And then at the end of the day, if we can all deliver, as, as Lauren mentioned, of, um, the, the customer side on the commercialization side, creating those real strategic partnerships, and maybe that's a, a customer contract, but it could also be delivered in other ways. If we're all adding value to those companies, we're gonna get the financial return at the end of the day. Um, so there's a, we believe that it makes a lot of sense to partner, and not just with hospital-based funds, but I mean, I think it makes sense for the deal to have a variety of expertise. The, in the round. Thank you, Anita. So, uh, I turn the, uh, the panel over to you all. Uh, any questions for uh, our, our, our guests here? Well, that's a first. <clears throat> Were we that comprehensive? Yeah, it should be possible. Uh, but preclinical can typically be a little bit more challenging. The question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The, the question is, do we engage in uh, preclinical uh, type ideas? And if so, would it be independent of any venture investments? Um, preclinical, pre uh, my sense is, I haven't encountered these yet, uh, but my sense is that preclinical, um, if it's not from within the clinic, um, 
I would have to see whether we can get clinical champions to engage that early. Um, but, but like I said, we have a different group uh, within the clinic that can help uh, work, uh, do preclinical work at the clinic. Um, and they typically will not look for equity. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, just curious, um, you know, as you reflect on um, technologies, companies, so forth that have come out of your, your home institutions, any, you know, patterns and markers you've, you've observed, you know, as far as more successful ones, be it technology areas or, you know, team composition or, you know, whatever you care to comment on, but, you know, kind of your own observed patterns and, and markers. I stand on that question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Physician CEOs um, can be successful, um, and we've seen them be successful. Oftentimes, a physician CEO um, is is perfect for the company up until a certain stage, and then you need to put someone in who's run a company before. Um, so I think that's you know when you're building a team, and that's something the. Um, early stage spin out we did invest in of UNC, the physician said early on, I want to be part of the company. I know that I'm an endocrinologist. I'm a really good endocrinologist. I've never run a company before. That company exited in two and a half years for a, a large multiple of what we invested in early stage. Um, so I, I think that's a key piece of, of making sure that and there, you know, we have companies where the physician has stayed involved at a very high level, um, and they have been successful. But oftentimes, they're not trained to run a company, uh, and that's really important. The team really comes it comes down to if the technology's good and the team's not, the company's not going to be successful. Are they trained to run a hospital? <laughs> Gary, you're going to ask. Yeah, yeah I, I think um, I, 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 that resonates with me. I think having the founder, either physician, nurse, um, as the Kind of the, the builder initially. That that's a it takes a lot of um, you know focus and endurance and grit because the early stage companies are the the most challenged in so many ways, resources, timelines. Um, so you know you want to enable that founder to get past the the uh, valley of death, if you will, into improving product market fit into financing their company project and so um, you're not going to necessarily get that with an outside CEO if you will so we, we tend to try to support our, our physician CEOs up until that point where things are going well and then another um, seasoned executive that has taken companies to the next level or exited companies can come in and, and continue the, the work of the company so very much you know that, that resonates with what we're seeing also more of a perspective from the area so you're dealing with more mature companies on average. Yeah, I would say most of the company, companies that we see, um, or at least the companies that we invest in have already made that transition, so they've already brought in um, someone from you know, more of a senior manager. And it's, not, it's not typically something that we have dealt with. So have you seen any patterns in with the companies you've invested in that, uh, that have been successful? Oh, um, in terms of industries and where no, I mean, we really haven't. We invest so broadly across services, across healthcare IT. I was with a, a fund prior, spending most of my time in, in healthcare. Similarly, uh, the main patterns that, that we tended to see were on um, strength of management. Um, you know, I think you can have a great idea and just an okay uh, management team, and you're not going to get there. Um, so for us, when we look back at where were we unsuccessful, it tends to be management. Um, or it tends to be even our relationship with management. You know, it wasn't great during the diligence, but we thought we could make it work. And um, typically, if you see those kind of red flags, or you know, uh, they they tend to crop up and become a bigger problem. So I would say it's management, and then it's also um, the issue of being just far too ahead of your time. So it's a fantastic idea, but it's you know seven, ten years too early. And you know, early stage investments take a lot of grit, uh, but seven to ten years is a long time. And, and we see a lot of things that are just a great idea and just before they Actually, I think that's, that's a, a differentiator on the strategic side. Our fund is not set up in a 10-year cycle, so we have a little bit more patience yeah. to weather the, uh, cycle, the the life cycle of the company. Yeah, that, that is a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a big, a big strength, right? Yeah. Um, 
I, I agree with all the comments here. I think I'll, I'll just parse it out a little bit further. I think what I'm seeing uh, in, in my 14 months here at the, at the clinic is a few different things that are working really well. One is intellectual property is not a product. So you've got to take intellectual property and you need somebody to drive into a product. And that can be accomplished um, by very talented product managers, uh, people who've had experience um, uh, taking a piece of IP, building some uh, surrounding IP around it, working with vendors, working with suppliers to build it into a product. You supplement that with, uh, and call it an EIR, uh, or a, a business-minded management uh, a team member, um, who can take it you know, further from a product and conceive the, the, the vision and the path to make it into a company. Uh, you need both uh, in, in order to make a successful uh, uh, company. And of, of course, I think what matters a lot nowadays is be very, very cognizant of the market you are trying to address, right? The smaller the market, the more challenging it is going to be to build a company around it. Uh, one of the benefits of working with a health system is that I, I, I think of it as not to really integrate because your customer is also to, some, uh, to, to a great extent uh, helping you innovate. Uh, and you, it's harder to do that industry in, in the industry. Uh, I find it uh, that it's a lot easier to do within the context of the health system. I, I think the only other thing I would add, um, and picking up on a comment Lauren made, is um, when you are looking for a clinical champion, we've seen a lot of companies where um, their clinical expertise, you know, their um, chief medical officer, someone say it's someone who's been retired for you know four, five, six years, and healthcare is changing so rapidly right now that a lot of times that, that expertise may be dated. So I think when you're thinking about who, who to engage um, for that advice and expertise, to make sure that, that they understand existing workflow, they understand existing pressures. And example, I'll give you as a company that we looked at a couple of years ago um, that was uh, kind of a nice to have, so really cool device um, for laparoscopic surgery. Um, what's in a must-have, and it added cost to the procedures, but the, the head of the company um, was a former surgeon and had a lot of former surgeon investors, and they're like, no, they'll just go in front of the value analysis committee and say, I gotta have this, you know, I, I can't do surgery without this device. And he's like, they're, you know, everybody's gonna buy it. I don't have any concerns about sales, and that's just not the reality any longer. I mean, every hospital is looking at how to reduce cost, and those nice to haves that that, they, that surgeons used to be able to be able to push through, that's just not reality any longer. I think there's another question, yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to carry that a little bit further. As working within hospital systems, you have a lot of resources to bring to companies, and as I'm sure you're looking for investors who can help, um, particularly looking at digital health devices, as we're starting to think about how can we make the device communicate with the electronic medical records. Um, do you bring you know, data scientists from your hospital to your medical records you know, uh, to support the companies? Oh, absolutely. Along with the absolutely. Too, right? absolutely. Yeah, we're doing two huge data pools for two of our portfolio companies right now. Um, and our um, enterprise analytics teams working directly with those companies as well as the clinical champions to truly understand what the data means. Ditto that will help integrate, uh, we'll deploy our resources uh, once we've made that commitment to the company. Yeah, um, yeah the, the one one advice I would have there is that um, keep, as a company that's working with the health system, keep your uh, uh, solution uh, as, uh, as I would say, uh, logically separated from the rest of the infrastructure at, at, uh, at a health system because you don't want to disturb everything they're doing, right? You want to you want to build your thing independently with their help, but not impact them by you know the other way around. Because if you do that, it will cause a lot of uh, uh, trauma, if I can call it that, within the health system. No, we don't. <laughs> uh, one last question from the audience. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, mean, I guess what I was also trying to get at is if you, you know, sort of look inwards at your own institution, you know, Mount Sinai and Cleveland Clinic and so forth, are there kind of specific innovation areas that you have, you know, reflecting back on the last decade or, you know, looking at your present portfolio, respect, you know, specific areas that you have found your, your home institution to be, you know, more adept or, or more, you know, facile and solving for, you know, one reason or another? 
so at your kind of individual institution level. Nope. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Please. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a great question. I think it's important for any fund, hospital-based fund that you're going to work with, to know what the strengths are of that healthcare system. So we we do that analysis on a regular basis ourselves. Um, what are the key strategic priorities of the organization so that we can match our investments to those strategic priorities? But we also look on what are our true strengths. Um, so at Rex, for example, I think we're a huge surgical center. So we look at a lot of, of devices and other solutions in the, the surgery space. Um, the UNC healthcare system is known for, um, especially oncology research, those companies for us are hard to invest in because they're longer plays than we tend to make. But we really want to understand where, not only where our expertise lies, but where do we have those champions who can move most nimbly. Um, prior leadership in our organization of pharmacy, they were really difficult to work with, and so we stopped looking at pharmacy solutions. Um, and same with anything that, that um, was a big lift for IT, we pulled back because the leadership at the time um, was not willing to work with companies in a way that was going to be meaningful for the companies and, and for the fund. So I think that's important that when you are engaging with a hospital-based fund is truly understand from, from us what not only what that expertise are, but where we identified those champions who are eager and hungry to work with early stage companies. No, I think you put that very well, so well that it reminded me what my answer is. <laughs> we only, uh, we, we've only seen uh, real success in the uh, business to business internal infrastructure functions we've invested in. So these are all things that effectively fall in the finance department procurement, supply chain, revenue cycle, uh, those are the investments that we've done that have done the best. Uh, and for all the reasons that Anita just said, they're engaged, they're easy to work with, they can share data, they can integrate with their systems, unlike IT, unlike anything clinical. Consumers so, so sensitive. It's really hard to get consumer deals done if it's like a directed consumer sales play. These are all these worries of conflicts of interest and uh, you know, manipulating the patient. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll break that in to a few different verticals. So um, just looking at it broadly, uh, Cleveland Clinic is particularly strong on medical devices. 60% of our portfolio is medical devices. It's a powerhouse. And there are a few things that are supporting it. Our, uh, we have a research institute uh, associated with Cleveland Clinic called LRI, Learner Research Institute. It's a top 10 NIH funded institute. Um, they, they have a lot of equipment, 3D printers, uh, robots, uh, all of that to facilitate development. Um, so uh, that's a particular area of strength. In, if I parse that further, we are particularly strong in cardiovascular and neuromodulation. Um, uh, uh, from an institute perspective, we are strong in cardiovascular, in urology, in, 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 uh, in, in GI, digestive diseases. Um, now if I shift to, and, and similar dynamics apply for therapeutics as well. If I shift, shift to healthcare IT, um, you know, uh, uh, solutions that, uh, uh, that we have been seeing so far have been more point solutions. Our IT department and the infrastructure within the clinic has to deal with close to, you know, 3,000 or 4,000 uh, uh, different vendors in, in, uh, in, in IT related solutions. Um, so, uh, point solutions become more challenging. Uh, and at the same time, enterprise class solutions are difficult to build. So it's a little bit of a, a, a difficult dynamic in, in healthcare IT. Gary, any thoughts before I get to the final word? I was just say we're a blend of the two answers there. All right, Lauren, final word for us today. Tell me, why would an investor okay. <laughs> want to work with Heritage? Um, you know, one of the, the benefits of, of Heritage uh, would be that because we have a pretty broad-based LP base, uh, we can work very well with companies that you know maybe start out in the provider space but have payer applications, and so we're able to help them um, to bridge that gap. Um, and so I, I would think that that's one of the, the bigger um, benefits there is, is we do have a diversification in terms of our LPs, and it, it really helps companies branch out to other go-to-market channels. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to the audience for uh, staying with us for the hour here. I hope you found this beneficial. I think there's some sort of survey uh, that you get sent at some point in time. Give us a high ranking because Lord knows we don't get paid for this. Uh, we are so, so grateful to our friends at uh, the Refining Early Stage Investment Conference for hosting us and for Garrett, Lauren, Trupal, and Anita for making the time to join us here and deal with my very frayed and disorganized moderation. 
Thank you so much again. Great afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you.